Welcome to you this week as we celebrate our time together worshiping God and today we have a very special service plan for you and that is we're going to move towards the end of the service in renewing our promises to Christ within the Methodist tradition this is known as a Covenant Sunday and what is very nice is that many churches throughout certainly the Methodist Church of Southern Africa do this at the beginning of the year and so as we celebrate today in this online fashion, know that there are many churches, certainly across our land, um, that could well be doing this in person or who have just finished their, their covenant services. And so it is our prayer that God would make himself known amongst us wherever we are watching this and whatever time of the week we are watching this. We thank uh, God that his spirit works in ways that we can't fully understand or even see, but we know that God is amongst us. And so just to highlight that and remind us, we light our candle and uh, we say a prayer together. Join me as we pray. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, to all who truly repent, this is God's gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God, in your constant love. In the fullness of your mercy, blot out our offenses. Wash away all our guilt and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Give us the joy of your help again and strengthen us with the willing spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. How often do you and I notice the signs around us? And I'm not speaking here about the signs of the times, I'm talking about the actual physical material signs that are around us. I'm talking about the street signs, I'm talking about the um, political posters saying, hey, vote, vote for me. I'm talking about the shop signs, come and buy this that's on special. Church signs, come and join us this Sunday. There's so many signs that are out there for us each one of them trying to get our attention trying to remind us of something slow down 60 kilometers in this particular zone whatever it is these signs are trying to elicit a reaction or a response from us and today in our message we remind ourselves that God is constantly speaking to us through signs God's message comes to us um, the good news and of God's love for us comes to us through the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It comes in signs and wonders, if you like. It comes in symbols. It comes through a pillar of cloud. It comes through water gushing from a rock. It comes from manna from heaven. It comes from the miracle of the, the storm being stilled or the waves suddenly um, stopping. There's, there's this constant reminder to us from the scriptures that God is speaking to us through signs. If you, if you look at Genesis chapter 9, which we're going to read to now, we come to perhaps one of the most clearest and pronounced of signs given to us by God that speaks of something, that speaks of a promise, that speaks of a covenant, and that is the sign of the rainbow. And I'm going to speak about that in a moment, but let's head off there. If you have a Bible, Genesis chapter 9, and let's read this account together. We'll start from around about verse 8, and let's hear what the passage says to us today. Today's reading is taken from Genesis chapter 9 verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock and all the wild animals all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, 
This is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living, living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my ra rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Here ends our reading for today. So did you notice that last line that Ken read for us? Let me just take us back there, verse 17. It says, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the life on earth. This is the sign. The writer of Genesis tells us that God doesn't just allow something to happen, but he wants to clarify it. And so he clarifies it with the obvious, with the sign, so that when people see the rainbow in the future, they will remember something. If you even go back to verse 13, it says this, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it seems that God is constantly doing that. He's not just saying something, but he's following up what he says and what he does with an action. And that action often uh, involves a sign, a symbol, a miracle, or something like that. And I think this is quite profound for us as we reflect on this. I wonder whether you know... Um, about the pinky swear. Um, if you ask children today, they know about it. Maybe you from your children or grandchildren would know this, but it's just a little fun game that children play when they, they want to show their friends that they really mean something and that the, the, the promise they're going to make is something they want to hold to. They say, come, let's, let's pinky swear. And then what that means is you take your pinky and they take their pinky and you, you, you put it together like that. And okay, this is the sign of our promise. If you like, this is the sign of our covenant, of our committing to this. And it's as if, you know, God, in, in the way um, that Genesis tells us, that after this has all happened, he says, I'm going to promise you something and I'm going to follow it up with a particular sign. But even in our modern times, we do things that are quite similar. We, we follow up our promises, our verbal promises, with some kind of action. Say, for example, you are involved in a business deal. There was a time when the simple act of shaking hands was enough to confirm that deal. Nowadays, one has to have lawyers, contracts, and a whole bunch of stuff and signatures here, there, and everywhere because people are, you know, sometimes prone to breaking those promises. But you understand what I'm saying is that a simple shake of the hands in some relationships can be a sign of that promise. When when folk get married and husband and wife get married and they ex exchange vows and, and one of the symbols they use is a wedding ring. You know, exchange the, the ring with, you, with your partner. It's a, it's a sign of something that's already been spoken, but you want it to be ratified with that. And if one looks at a very quick tour of the other covenants in the Old Testament leading to the New Testament, you would see that every time there was a covenant, there was a sign. Abraham's covenant with God, the, the sign of the promise was sealed through the circumcision. The Mosaic Covenant, that, that covenant was sealed through the giving of the Ten Commandments. The, uh, David's covenant, um, the Kingdom Covenant, regulating how things on earth and how the eternal rule of the Kingdom of God would work was, was sealed through a, a king. And then you come through to the New Covenant, where this covenant was sealed through the life and the death of Jesus. So I think you understand what I'm saying, friends, is that when we we look at God's promises, they are always attached to some kind of sign. So hold that thought in mind as we now move on to, to look at the other passage for today. Arguably the best sign that God ever gave to us is mentioned by the angels in Luke's gospel. When Jesus was born, if you read it, the angels appear to the shepherds and uh, part of what they say is this. I read from verse 12. 
This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And it's another reminder for us that in giving all these signs, God wants to be found by us. It's not that God is trying to hide from his promise and from his part of the covenant, but as, as humans, we have drifted on our own course. And so we are reminded that in Christ giving us these signs and God giving us these signs, he's trying to get our attention. In Hebrews chapter 8, which is another reading set for today from verse 6, it says this, But in fact, the ministry that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator and is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people, and he said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And if you want, you can carry on reading just for the sake of time. I'm, I'm going to leave it there, but that's from Hebrews chapter 8. And it's as if the writer of Hebrews is saying to us that Jesus is the sign of God's covenant. And we either receive or reject God's offer by our response to the sign. And I think this is such a challenge to us because we are not responding to a material, uh, physical, metal sign. You know, if, if you're driving down the road and the, a sign caught your attention and said, God loves you. You know, there's, there's something about that. Yes, we hear the message, but it, it, it doesn't really arrest us as much as if you were walking along the road and you encountered God and God was saying, Delm, I love you. Suddenly now it's pretty hard to reject that. And so when we understand that the person of Jesus is the one who's making the promise and who is the sign, so it challenges us on a completely, uh, on a completely different level. And so as we now look at, at how we can respond to this, remember that just as Luke was saying, there will be a sign. And the sign, as far as we understand, is Jesus himself. So let's carry on now and see from another passage, this time from the Gospels, as to what these signs say to us. In his book called He Chose the Nails, Max Lucado shares in one of the chapters about this particular theme. He speaks about it as God's promise through a sign. And he was drawing our attention in that chapter to John chapter 19, where when Jesus was crucified, a sign was placed above his head. Let me read from verse 16. It says, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with, with him two others, one on each side, and then Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate responds, what I have written, I have written. And I always find it so fascinating that Pilate inadvertently is used by God to spread the gospel because of that sign. So it's that sign that's written in three different languages that portrays a message to anybody who's willing to look up the cross and see Jesus on the cross. It's written in Aramaic, written in Latin, and in Greek. And so thousands of people would have come to that place and seen this is the king of the Jews. Of course, not everyone believed that, but the sign said that. And so as we look at, at how Pilate is used by God in a, in a strange way, so we also ask ourselves, has God perhaps used other people or other circumstances to convey messages or signs to us that maybe we just need to hear? I think about... John Wesley, uh, when they were sailing on, um, on that voyage to, to the U.S. as missionaries, and they got caught up in that storm, and how Wesley, with his faith at that particular time, he was petrified. He was panicking. He thought, Lord, I'm going to drown. 
But in that moment, God used that group of Moravians who were there caught up in the same storm, but were singing and praying and praising God. And that had a profound effect on Wesley, so much so that he inquired more of the Moravians as to you know, how they had that level of faith. So it was a sign, if you like, of, of God using this moment to, to work something out in, in Wesley's life. And, and remember, it's Wesley himself who later on encourages us to, to have this covenant service, to make this covenant prayer. And so we, we look at the sign, the sign above Jesus' cross, and see how God uses that, um, not only to promise us something, but also to speak into our lives. And so as we hear that, we now need to really come to the point of our own response. Um, and so stay with me as we start moving towards that conclusion. So a question for us at this point is this, what will our sign be? What will your sign and my sign be in response to the signs that Christ has given us? Because as we come to the covenant, as we come to the covenant prayer, it's about a response to what God has done for us. For some people, they like to wear a cross around their neck. For some people, they like to put a bumper sticker on their car. Some people, even today, is quite quite fashionable to actually get a cross or or a scripture verse tattooed on, on your body. We respond in different ways. But the important thing is that our response is not just a yes, and then we carry on living the same kind of life. It's a, it's a response to God that involves everything. Andrew Murray once said that God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life that is wholly yielded to him. And it's for that reason that we spent the last three weeks looking at that theme of discover, uncover, and recover. Because remember, that the scripture passage, John 15, verse 9, was about remaining in Christ, remaining connected to the vine. And so when we respond to the signs that God gives to us, when we um, say our own covenant prayers, when we recommit our life to Christ, it's about that strong desire to remain in Christ. And folk, let's be honest, that's not always easy, is it? We we had a look at some of the things two weeks ago that, that separate us from God, that separate us from each other. And there's a lot of that stuff that goes on deep inside of us. But as we come in this time in a few moments to to renew our commitment to say this covenant prayer we we're not committing to never make another mistake but we're committing to say lord this is what my heart's desire is this is what i want to do i want to remain connected to you i mean even just the opening words of that prayer um, it says this i am no longer my own but yours it's it's saying to christ christ i don't want to carry on living for myself selfishly i want to live for you. It's a reminder that we belong to Christ um, and that Christ embraces us and Christ loves us. I wonder just before we go to one of our last shots, if you remember the movie Toy Story, it was very famous and it still is out. You can still watch it if you haven't seen it. It's had many sequels too, but the very first uh, Toy Story came out in 1995 and there was this scene in the movie where Buzz Lightyear, and if you don't know who Buzz Lightyear is, well, you'll have to Google, but essentially he is the, the main character, the much-loved toy um, of, of the, the little boy in the movie called Andy. But essentially what happens is Bud, Buzz Lightyear gets lost, and he lands up in a, another toy box in another bedroom, and he begins to feel hopeless. He begins to feel very depressed, and uh, he wonders if ever he'll be found. And there's a little part in the movie where suddenly he looks down and he sees that underneath his shoe is the the name Andy. And this just brings a smile to his face because suddenly he remembers that he's not just any toy that's got lost in some other child's room, but he is a toy. He is Buzz Lightyear who belongs to Andy. Andy is the boy who loves him and who cares for him and who plays with him. And I think that's such a, a very simple, maybe a child, childlike illustration, but it says to you and I that when we say yes to Jesus, it's as if we have at the bottom of our shoe Jesus written on it, so that we, we belong to Christ and he loves us. Um, and I hope that that's just a, another way of looking at this covenant as we, as we say it in a few moments' time.
The Russian writer Pavel Polos wrote in the 1980s a very challenging thought. He wrote to Christians who were mainly in America, but I think we understand his sentiment. He said this, In Russia, Christians are tested by hardship, but in America you are tested by freedom. And testing by freedom is much harder. Nobody pressures you about your religion, so you relax and you're not so concentrated on Christ or on his teaching or how he wants you to live. And I think that that's quite a challenging word, certainly for the church um, in, in perhaps the first world countries that, that don't struggle um, with, with a whole bunch of persecution. But if you come back to this prayer that we're going to pray in a moment, and if you know anything about the covenant prayer, it has some really, really challenging thoughts in it. And let me just read a few more where Wesley was saying, put me to do what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. In other words, you know, put me to do things for you. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you. In other words, let my hands be used for your glory or let me be laid aside for you exalted for you or brought low for you i mean just those thoughts every line in this in this prayer is a prayer of relinquishment and saying lord i surrender to you and and i mean i've said this prayer for many many years um, as as some of you have and every year when i come to say it i think to myself wow Dom, are you are you really ready to to pray this um because i think what um, the russian writer pavel polis was saying is that you know, sometimes when you, when you have nothing, when all you're facing is trial and suffering, reaching out to God is all you've got. But sometimes when we live in comfort and have everything at our disposal, then giving our all to God, you know, doesn't seem that important. And so I ask us to, to think about this call that God has made on us. Remember last week I spoke about the difference between discipleship and, and calling yourself a Christian and about the power of accountability and prayer. And so as we, as we come to surrender to Christ again, um, I'm going to invite us to say the prayer. And uh, the words will come up onto the screen for you. But if you are ready and if you are willing to pray this prayer, then I ask you to join me in this. And may it be our surrender, may it be part of our sign, our response to the many, many signs God has given to us, but especially the sign of Christ. And so, come let us pray together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to do what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours so be it and the covenant now made on earth let it be ratified in heaven amen